Before I begin, I'd like to remind everyone that my remarks today are my own and don't necessarily reflect the views of the Federal Open Market Committee. That's the necessary disclaimer that I have to give. 104 years ago, Congress created the Federal Reserve, our nation's central bank, but they did something unique. They distributed the central bank across 12 regional independent Federal Reserve banks rather than having it all housed at the Board of Governors in Washington, D.C. Congress did this because they wanted to ensure that the different regions across our country were directly represented in economic policymaking. And so that the many local variations of varying conditions across the United States were appropriately considered. That's literally, literally why we have a Federal Reserve Bank in Minneapolis, to understand and represent the economic conditions in our region, which we call the Ninth Federal Reserve District. As Stephen said, I've been president of the Minneapolis Fed for just over a year. And although I grew up in the Midwest, I am new to the 9th District. And so getting out across the district and getting to know our many communities, their strengths and their challenges is very important to me. In that regard, we've had a very productive first year. I've traveled across the district visiting many parts of Minnesota, but also North and South Dakota, Montana, Wisconsin, and the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. Now, people have repeatedly asked me, what has most surprised me about our region, and specifically about Minnesota? Our region has many strengths, a diverse economy with agriculture, manufacturing, natural resources, healthcare, and technology sectors all represented. The business community here has an unusually strong, genuine interest in civic engagement and giving back to the community complemented by strong nonprofit and philanthropic sectors. We also have an educated, high-performing workforce and, on average, low unemployment. The workforce is supported by an education system that consistently ranks near the top in national surveys. Minnesota ranks number three in the country, according to test scores, with 45% of our students above the proficiency level. Our high school graduation rate is 92.4% which is the second best in the country. Our labor force participation rate is seventh highest and our poverty rate ties for third lowest in the United States. Now those are some of the positives and there is indeed much to be proud of. Yet I was surprised to learn with all that success, our region and Minnesota in particular have some of the worst racial and economic disparities in the country. Difference in median income between whites and African Americans is approximately $30,000, giving us a rank of 41st across the states. Moreover, we rank 40th in unemployment gap, 40th in test score gaps, and 42nd in differences in high school graduation rates. I didn't expect to find this, and I don't understand why it is this way. So I began to ask questions of our research economists at the Minneapolis Fed. Why do we have these gaps? The truth is we don't know for sure. I asked community leaders, I asked nonprofit leaders, and I heard a variety of answers. Education issues, lack of economic development, discrimination, among many other explanations. But none of these answers seem complete to me, and nor, frankly, do they seem complete to those who are offering the suggestions. So I began looking around the country for answers and asking researchers across the Federal Reserve System. For example, David Wilcox is the Director of Research and Statistics at the Federal Reserve's Board of Governors in Washington, D.C. He and I discussed the fact that unemployment among African Americans is generally about twice the level for whites. If the economy is strong and white unemployment is 4%, African American unemployment will likely be around 8%. At the worst of the last recession, when white unemployment was around 8%, African-American unemployment was around 16%. Even if you compare college graduates against college graduates, the relative position is similar. Why is that? What are the structural factors that are leading to these disparities? To be honest, we don't really know for sure. And we need to know the answers to these fundamental questions if we hope to develop effective solutions. But this isn't just about racial disparities, though those are very important. Instead of having this discussion at the Urban League in North Minneapolis, we could be having a similar discussion in the Iron Range, one of the first regions I visited after joining the bank, 
where many workers and families are struggling because of low iron ore prices and a relative lack of mining jobs. We could be having this conversation about a lack of economic opportunity and inclusive growth in rural communities around the 9th District that are struggling. We could be having this meeting in Michigan or Wisconsin where some manufacturing plants have closed down or, or downsized in recent decades. We could be having this conversation in almost any state in our nation. A lack of economic opportunity does not know racial or ethnic boundaries. There are people in all communities who are struggling to get a fair chance at a good education and a good job. So how do we create a robust, growing economy that includes all Americans in the context of globalization and ongoing technological change? How do we ensure that all Americans have genuine economic opportunity for themselves and for their families? The American dream is a central tenet of our society, yet in the last 30 years, the proportion of Americans who have stopped believing in it has tripled from roughly 10% to 30%. And quite aside from believing in it, many no longer are seeing it. As Professor Raj Chetty's work has shown, a far smaller portion of people born in 1980 have achieved a higher standard of living than their parents compared with what was true 25 or 50 years earlier. Earlier this week, we celebrated the life and legacy of Martin Luther King Jr. But we also remember the principles he committed his life to, justice, equality, the inherent human dignity of every man, woman, and child. When we measure ourselves against these principles, we can acknowledge progress. But we must be honest in our assessment and continue with the renewed energy because there is yet much more work to be done. Now, Congress has given the Federal Reserve a dual mandate, stable prices and maximum employment. That's our mission. I translate stable prices roughly as an economy that's not overheating, but also not limping along. Think of it as steady growth. <clears throat> maximum employment is conceptually clear, though it's difficult to measure. How do we have an economy that is growing at its highest sustainable rate, such that as many Americans who want to work are able to do so. That's the mandate that the US Congress has given us. Now, the traditional view among central bankers is that there's not much we can do about economic opportunity and inclusive growth. The reason is that monetary policy, which is our primary policy instrument, is a blunt instrument. We have to set one interest rate for the whole nation for all of our people, all of our businesses. We can't target it to certain sectors or industries or regions or communities or ethnic groups. So we have to look at the aggregate data on the national economy to see if we are achieving our dual mandate on average over time. But is it really true that we shouldn't look underneath the averages to see what effect our national policies are having on different groups? I think we should be open to re-examining that assumption. For example, here in Minnesota, we are ranked number one in the country for home ownership. 74.7% 74 of our homes are occupied by their owners. But if we look across different groups, we find that while 77.1% of whites in our state own their own homes, only 27.6% of African Americans do. And perhaps most importantly, the Federal Reserve System employs some of the best researchers in the world, literally with hundreds of PhD economists on staff around the country. Even if we conclude that monetary policy is not the best tool for addressing issues around economic opportunity and inclusive growth because it is too blunt, we still have an important role to play. If we can do the research to understand the root causes of the problems and identify potential fiscal solutions or other approaches, I believe it is appropriate for the Federal Reserve to do that research and inform the public about our findings. Achieving our maximum employment mandate might require a combination of traditional monetary policy tools as well as research into non-monetary solutions for other policymakers to consider. <clears throat> I have discussed these issues at length with Federal Reserve Board Chair Janet Yellen. And she is in full agreement that the Federal Reserve has an important role to play in addressing these issues. 
So today I'm announcing that we are establishing what we're calling the Opportunity and Inclusive Growth Institute, which will be housed at the Minneapolis Fed. The mission of the Institute will be to conduct and promote research that will increase economic opportunity and inclusive growth for all Americans and help the Federal Reserve achieve its maximum employment mandate. Now, serious academic work on many of these issues is being done at universities across the country, and some is already being done in the Federal Reserve system. We don't want to duplicate the work that is already being done. We want to complement that work and bring the focus perspective of one of the most important economic policy institutions in our nation to these issues. Our institute will adopt a multidisciplinary approach that includes participation of leading academics from a variety of fields, including economics, education, law, public health, public policy, and sociology. Chair Yellen shared a quote with us, which is the Opportunity and Inclusive Growth Institute is an important research initiative focusing on some of the most important, some of the most pressing economic issues we face as a nation. This work has the potential to help more Americans find real economic opportunity. I hope that scholars inside and outside the Federal Reserve System will contribute to this important work. Now, the Institute will have a number of important components to start. First, we've recruited a world-class advisory board to help us identify topics where the Federal Reserve System can make a significant contribution that complements work already being done. Second, we are launching an annual visiting scholars program, which will invite scholars to pursue research while in residence here at the Minneapolis Fed, working side by side with Federal Reserve researchers. If you are a scholar working on issues of economic opportunity and inclusive growth, we want you. Details, information for how you can apply is on our website at minneapolisfed.org. Third, we are launching a conference series to bring together experts from within and from outside the Federal Reserve System so we can learn as much as we can from one another on these important issues. The first conference will be here in Minnesota on May 22nd of this year when we will explore where the Federal Reserve can best focus our talents and resources to make growth and opportunity more inclusive. And finally, we are creating a working paper series to showcase the research that people across the Federal Reserve and affiliated experts are producing so that other researchers and practitioners can learn, comment, and take it forward. Now, today is just the kickoff. The hard work is yet to come. In many cases, these issues are decades in the making. We aren't going to find a silver bullet in six months or a year, but we need to ramp up our efforts in partnership with leading researchers around the country. This is going to be a long-term research-driven initiative focused on helping all Americans have real economic opportunity and participate in a growing economy. We know that these issues are not going to be solved by the Federal Reserve alone, but we are going to do our part. Researchers in universities around the country are already playing an important role, as are educators, community leaders, and local, state, and federal policymakers. The nonprofit and philanthropic communities are doing critically important work on the ground, putting theoretical ideas into action. Our institute will focus on world-class research, but this is not an effort divorced from all of you. Ideas on where we should investigate, feedback on our efforts, and work to turn research into practical policy falls to all of us. We look forward to working with you, and we look forward to learning from you. Thank you very much. I look forward to the discussion with Stephen and with all of you. So our format is going to be that Neil and I are going to have a conversation, just a couple of guys uh, kicking it in front of a, you know, a few of their friends. And then uh, I'm going to invite all of you to join in the conversation as well. Okay. So how are you doing? I'm doing great, thank you. <laughs> so my first question is that this institute, the Opportunity Inclusive Growth Institute, uh, and, and really the ideas that are behind it, that framed it, are pretty far afield from monetary policy. Or, or maybe they're not. The, the question is, why is this initiative consistent with the mission uh, of the Federal Reserve to stabilize prices and maximize employment? And is it a wise investment of taxpayer resources? Well, uh, I think it's 
I think it's a very wise investment of taxpayer resources because if we have an economy that includes all of our people, uh, it's going to be easier for us to achieve our mandate, which is a growing economy and maximum employment, and all of society will be better off. I mean, I'll be honest with you, I wouldn't be doing my job if I wasn't trying to drive this kind of change and get people focused on these kind of issues. And the nice thing is when we talk to people across the Federal Reserve System, there's great interest in making sure we're doing everything we can to solve these, these problems. You know, these problems are, are decades in the making. People have been working on them a long time. We need to ramp up our efforts because we're not making progress fast enough. And yet, if uh, you read between the lines, or at least read carefully the lines, as I uh, had an opportunity to, to take a look at your remarks before you made them, uh, the mission of the Institute really is to promote opportunity for all Americans. And some might argue, or some might view that as, is that a retreat from the, the fact that what is driving this is that there is opportunity for some Americans, specifically for African Americans and for other communities that have been marginalized and do not share in the robust growth uh, in this local economy? Well, I think that's what we need to address. I mean, I, I, when I meet a young person who is not, look, my parents came to this country from India 50 years ago, right? So son of immigrants, and I've been able to achieve, live the American dream. How did I get that? My parents were in a position to see to it that I got a good education. And they helped me navigate the education system. And once I got that good education, I was able to get that good first job. And that led to a better job. And that led to a better job. You know, once you break the cycle of poverty, and I think education is one of the keys to breaking that cycle, generations are now transformed. Because that person then passes it on to their children and their children and their children. And so, to me, these are enormously important problems, but these are solvable problems, and it's in all of our interest to tackle them and break the cycles that are holding some people back and give everybody the same opportunity. So let me press a little bit further sure. on this. Do you envision the Institute as having as its primary driver the lack of opportunity and the lack of inclusion for African Americans and other people of color, or is it a broader mission really to see to it that all Americans are engaged fully in the economy? I think it's both. I mean, I think that the, clearly, if you just look at the data, the communities that are being most left behind are, tend to be communities of color. But I think the solutions that we find that can help these communities are, will probably help everybody. You know, if we focus on creating, just take education as an example, schools that work for the kids that need the most help, guess what? They're going to work for kids that need only a little bit of help. And so let's focus on, I want to help everybody. I want this institute to help everybody. But I think we need to focus our efforts on where the need is greatest. You mentioned, <coughs> excuse me, you started talking a little bit about your own background. Um, can you talk about how your upbringing and how your family values inform your uh, commitment to issues of inequality and disparity? You know, it's interesting. Um, so one is I mentioned my own sense of gratitude for the life that I've been able to lead and the opportunity I've been able to have which literally is empowered, was created because I was able to get a good education. I think it all started there, and I have to credit my parents for focusing on education. My father, uh, he was a professor at the local college, but he dedicated his life's work to trying to eradicate poverty in uh, third world countries, in Africa and in India. He and received one, the presidential uh, award for that. He day. did, and so one of the highlights for me when I was a kid is <coughs> when I was in high school, he got an award from... President George Herbert Walker Bush, first President Bush, for his work to try to end hunger. And so it was pretty cool when I was a sophomore in high school getting to go with my parents to the White House when, uh, when he got that award. And that, I think that made a, it left an impression on me that you can take your great ideas and apply them in a way that help other people have the same opportunity you've had. And so his work was focused internationally. Uh, so far, my work has been focused uh, domestically. And my, you know, my time in, the, in Washington during the financial crisis, I learned how important public policy is. And good public policy can make a huge difference in millions of people's lives. We'd be crazy not to take it on. Well, speaking of public policy, we're entering uh, in the, or we either entering or in the midst of a political era that has been openly hostile to immigration and to immigrants. And yet, you are the son of immigrants and have advocated for reforming immigration laws, I'm quoting here, to make it easier for high-skilled immigrants to come to America and for immigrants who receive advanced training to stay here. 
which you argue would, again, quoting, lead to a higher economic growth rate and more jobs here at home. I'm quoting from your paper on non-monetary problems and slow recovery that you released earlier this year. Do you see your positions as having any traction in the new administration in Congress? Well, I think um, I'm optimistic that uh, <laughs> I'm optimistic that if you look at you know setting aside the issues that we're focused on right now, which is issues of disparity, across the country, people want higher economic growth. I think that that's across party lines. Everybody wants higher economic growth. If you look at the sources of the where that growth comes from. Part of it comes from when we invent new things. Yeah. So technology development makes us more productive. Part of it comes from population growth. And the truth is, our society, the population is not growing the way it did 20, 30, 40 years ago. So it's just math, right? This is algebra. We can either accept slower growth because we're not having as many kids, or we can try to get that fertility rate up, which is tough, or we can embrace immigration as a way to get that growth rate back up. And so this is math. This is not a partisan commentary, Republican, Democrat. This is literally math. And that's what the math says. So I think if, if we as a country want higher growth, immigration is going to have to be part of that. And yet some might argue that um, your position, um, your proposal to focus on uh, immigrants who have, who essentially are credentialed would create a sort of a class structure for immigration where we reward with preferred immigration status those immigrants who come credentialed, who come qualified, contributing, and where we sort of throw into another bucket into a non-preferential class, <clears throat> excuse me, immigrants who um, don't come with credentials and whose status is essentially they're seeking you know, uh, economic opportunity, you know, the, the mass of tired, uh, wretched refuse, so to speak. Uh, how, how would you respond to that? Well, it's a fair question. I'll just tell you this. Other countries are doing it. So if we have, as a country, if we decide, whatever the country decides, this is the number of immigrants per year that we want to welcome. And you, the country can decide whatever that number is. Other countries are saying, well, let's pick and choose the skills and the workers we need for our economy. Canada has been very aggressive in doing this, and some other countries as well. So I would just offer to you, whatever we as a country decide we want to do in terms of the numbers we want to welcome every year, it'd be in our interest to decide, hey, maybe we need more workers to work farms, or maybe we need more high-skilled workers to think strategically about which skills we need to feed our economy. See, I'm, and now I'm hearing my mother's voice, Neil, that said, if, if all your friends jump off the bridge, are you going to jump off too? Well, I don't think that's fair. I don't think that's fair characterization because... Well, I'm, let me tell you what I'm saying there. I'm saying that because it seems to me that the United States, it, part of its bully pulpit opportunity is establishing a moral voice and to say, as an example, this is what's right, that we're not going to promote classism in a country that sort of eliminated classes. And so let's look at immigration from a broader, more egalitarian standard. That's, that's what I'm getting at. And, and I'm sympathetic with that view, but I'll give you an example that I bet nobody here would disagree with. Today in our country, we uh, graduate immigrants with good degrees from our best universities, and then we tell them they're not welcome to stay, and we send them home. That's insane. Right? We're spending taxpayer money educating people with the best skills possible and then sending them home and saying you're not welcome. <laughs> I mean, I can't imagine you'd think that's a good policy no, either. No, so no. That's, that's low-hanging fruit that I think people on both sides of the aisle generally agree with. Let me move on, change it, pivot a little bit. What do you see as the role of nonprofit organizations in addressing and even researching economic disparities, especially where their constituencies are comprised largely of people of African descent and uh, others with significant structural disadvantages? I think the nonprofit community is enormously important because they are the practitioners on the ground who are engaging with the people, right? men, women, children, who are looking for opportunity. and the, they're a source of great information, great insight, wisdom. You know, we at the Federal Reserve, uh, we kind of need to stick to what we're good at, which is we're good at doing the long-term research. We're not the practitioners on the ground, but we have to partner with the nonprofits who are the practitioners on the ground to see what is working, what are they learning, give us feedback so that we can tailor our research, and then hopefully if we come up with good ideas, they're the ones who are then able to go implement it in the community. So I think the nonprofit communities are vital. When you ran for governor of California, I think in 2014, Correct. 
you proposed a surprising idea for a self-described free market Republican, and that was to provide a 10-year corporate income tax holiday or, or an abeyance or withholding for any currently operating business outside of California that moved to the state and created at least 100 new jobs. Now, assuming you still believe that that idea has merit, what would you say about replicating that model on a local basis, like right here on the north side of Minneapolis, and providing tax incentives to businesses that move to North Minneapolis and create at least 100 jobs? I, I, it's it's uh, funny, you're pulling stuff back, which I hadn't thought about in a while. Uh, I still think these are good ideas. You know, as a country, it's hard to do these things nationally, but it's easy, I mean, to be perfectly honest with you, it's much easier for a state to take businesses from other states and bring it into that state, or to encourage locally businesses to move into a certain community. And I think tax policy certainly can be, can be part of it. We have a 50-state laboratory of lots of things that are being tried all around the country. So some states have done exactly that. You know, I visited Alabama, where this idea came from. I visited Alabama several years ago, and everyone kept talking to me about Alabama's booming auto industry. And I said, how in the world did Alabama get a booming auto industry? Well, they did this. They created incentives to bring the first few auto plants to Alabama. They came, they set up shop, then the workforce started getting very skilled in building cars. And then other car companies said, hey, we want to tap that workforce. So more car companies then came to Alabama. And that's where the germ of that idea came from. So I think these ideas are absolutely worth considering. You know, my broader message is this. The time for incrementalism is over. Right? We've been trying incremental solutions for decades, and we don't have a lot to show for it. So if we're really serious about tackling some of these issues, we need to try bold moves. And some of those ideas were representative of that. So speaking of incrementalism, you stated publicly that you are against raising the minimum wage, which seems on the surface maybe contrary to what the Institute would be trying to address, which is income inequality. But would you explain your opposition to... Uh, so I, I have not actually uh, stated publicly that I'm against raising the minimum wage. You have not? I'm sorry. No, I've said that there are trade-offs. Okay. And we should be honest about what the trade-offs are. So if you're starting from a position of low unemployment, as we are in Minneapolis today, and you raise the minimum wage, there are likely to be fewer side effects, meaning few people are going to end up losing their jobs as a result of it. If you're starting from a position of high unemployment and you raise the minimum wage, that hurts the workers who don't have jobs today, and it makes it harder for them to get jobs. So there are trade-offs. You know, you raise the minimum wage, you help the workers who currently have jobs and who keep their jobs, no question about it. But it does make it harder for those who do not have jobs. And so that's where I just said the trade-off needs to be considered. There's no free lunch, and we should be honest about what the trade-offs are in these decisions. Many uh, politicians and public policy makers, uh, even regulators, have shared their platforms for addressing financial challenges faced by the middle class. They range from tax breaks and banking regulations, health care reforms, and the like. But there's often little or no reference to the myriad challenges faced by people living in poverty who are often unbanked. Uh, living in unstable housing and either unemployed or underemployed. Uh, do you see the Federal Reserve System and specifically the Federal Reserve of Minneapolis as having a role in responding to the needs of the marginalized poor beyond the creation of this institute? Uh, absolutely. I mean, we have a, lot of, a long history of work in uh, trying to increase access to credit to communities of color, to low-income communities, communities that are unbanked, as you've said. And the work is being done not just in Minneapolis Fed, but around the whole country. For example, looking at technology and how technology can break through some of these barriers to reach people. If you look at other countries, as an example, I just read an article, was in The Economist or I can't remember what newspaper yesterday, on uh, I think it was an African country, which is escaping me, where mobile phone penetration is very, very high. And through those mobile phones, they're now delivering banking services that people did not have access to before. And so we absolutely, the Federal Reserve absolutely has a role to play, and we've been working on it for a long time, but I think we have more work to do. So my last question before we uh, open it up to questions from all of you is, uh, a rocket scientist, a banker, and a regulator walk into a bar. <laughs> Each of them orders a beer. Bartender says, we don't serve your kind. The rocket scientist says, I don't have time for this. It's more efficient to walk to the bar down the street, and he gets up and walks up. 
The banker says the market will catch on to this guy and he'll be out of business soon and he walks away. The regulator turns to the bartender and asks, can I see the list of beers you won't serve me? <laughs> Where do you see yourself in that picture, Neil? Is there something to be said about the futility of studying a problem in the face of injustice and inequality and prejudice? And uh, is there a role for naming outright the thing that is harming you? Oh yeah, absolutely, there's a role, absolutely. What I'm saying is Congress has given, the way our government works, and I didn't know this until I went to Washington, all of us, you can do whatever you wanna do. You can become a teacher, you can become a doctor, do whatever you wanna do, as long as what you wanna do is not prohibited by law. Right? The presumption is with you, but you may not steal, you may not kill, et cetera. Our government is the exact opposite. The way our government works, is the executive branch of government and agencies like the Fed can only do things that Congress has said, you may do these three or four things. The presumption is against us. We're not allowed to just do whatever we want. We have to live within the rules that Congress has given us. So Congress has given the Federal Reserve certain responsibilities. And my message to you is not that we can solve all these problems by ourselves. My message to you is that we're gonna do our part. And we're gonna, whatever that data shows, whatever that research shows, we're gonna publish it for the public to consider, for other policymakers to consider. And then we need other actors to do their part. You know, go back to the financial crisis. One of the things that really ticked me off about the financial crisis was in hindsight, you've heard this, nobody went to jail, right? Now, my job and the Treasury Department and the Fed's job during the financial crisis was trying to put out the fire keep the financial system from collapsing, keep us from falling into the Great Depression. We don't, we're not lawyers, we're not prosecutors, we're not in a position to go out and pursue the criminals that in some cases participated in the crisis. But we need every element of our government and nonprofit sectors and business leaders and community leaders to do their parts. And so I'm saying to you is, we can't solve this by ourselves. I don't wanna promise you that. We know we can't, but we're gonna do our part. So it sounds like you're saying, if, if I can put it in my language, that um, as citizens, we have the right to go until somebody says stop. But the government has to stop until somebody, somebody says, says go. go. Okay. And so your encouragement to all of us is to get out there and go and to help and to work on this. Absolutely. And partner with us. Questions? Okay, we're done here. Oh, yes. <laughs> in, the, in the back. There's microphones are circulating, help. so yep. I'm, I'm curious about the role that the new institute will have in being kind of a research platform. So, shoot, does that mean it's a bad idea when it does that? <laughs> Shh, seems a controversy, it does that. Um, so, for example, you gentlemen just bandied about just a little bit on the minimum wage, and I know there's some very noble folks that think a $15 minimum wage is a good thing for Minneapolis, one of the things I hear about is that one of their motivations is to eliminate some you know, racial disparities, right? But when I cruise around Minneapolis and I took a stroll through the Carmel Mall recently, the Somali Mall in kind of South Central Minneapolis, and more and more I see signs of development and new businesses, and I can't read the signs because the folks whose names are on there are too exotic for me, right? So I think there's uh, the best way to really eliminate these disparities is to get true economic strength in these various communities. And I'm concerned that a minimum wage will, in a short run, help a few folks at the first rung of the economic ladder, but disrupt this upward mobility that I think we're seeing here in Minneapolis among all these immigrant communities and other folks of color who are building businesses and building real wealth. So long answer, you know, kind of long question, but. Will you be helping folks research that so that the city council can make the best decision they can on issues like that with objective evidence for both sides of the story? Well, I think that, that I think the minimum wage broadly is a very important topic. I think a lot of research has been done, and we'll, we will follow where the research leads us. And if more research is needed and we have a uh, expertise that can help understand it, then we're absolutely happy to do that. Uh, you know, people can take it too far in both extremes. I'll give you an example. So when I say there are trade-offs, some people say, well, raising the minimum wage does not hurt jobs, that that's a lie. And then you can quickly rebut that by saying, okay, make it 50, right? And obviously, at some level, it's gonna destroy jobs. 
The other extreme is if you think that raising the minimum wage is a bad idea, then you must mean you should eliminate the minimum wage. Because if raising it to 15 is a bad idea, taking it to zero must be better. Obviously, that's also taking it too far. And so ultimately, I think that political leaders and local leaders need to look at the local economy and look at the trade-offs and get a sense of how is the community doing, how many people are going to be helped, what are the costs, and what's, what are the consequences. And so I think we can do the research, but some of these judgments are judgment calls that local community need to make with their local elected representatives. They're not only, they're not only judgment calls, they're also political calls. And I would say in partial response to the gentleman's point that <clears throat> the anecdotal uh, information that we receive here at the Urban League is that $15 makes a difference and that they're not mutually exclusive objectives. That is, economic prosperity and growth is not exclusive of saying that we also need a higher minimum wage. And so perhaps what we need is a higher minimum wage and more jobs so that the people who are presently excluded can, when they do become hired, can get $15 an hour. Now, I understand that these forces operate in tension of each other, but if you ask people who are working for seven, eight, nine dollars an hour, if $15 an hour is a good thing, they will easily and overwhelmingly tell you yes. Thank you very much for your presentation. This is great. It sounds interesting. I've got a two questions, actually. One is, uh, is this program institutionalized within the Fed? So therefore, would this transcend your term should you leave? And then the second is, how are you going to go about choosing partners to implement what you come up uh, through the research efforts? Thank you for your questions. Yes, it is, uh, it is being institutionalized at the Minneapolis Fed. And barring something unforeseen should be here for the foreseeable future. Because this work needs to be done over the long term if we're going to uh, make a dent in these issues. In terms of partners, we want to partner with anybody who wants to partner with us. I mean, frankly, we're going to have different ways of engaging with, for example, the nonprofit community. We've already had some meetings. We're bringing in outside experts, sharing their ideas, and we're very open-minded. And so we're going to, we'll have different ways of people to reach out to us, to participate, to send in their ideas. And then we're looking forward to partnering as broadly as we possibly can. Yes, uh, Al Flowers. Hey, uh, I just want to uh, say, I want to ask you, uh, uh, this past uh, year, the, uh, the legislature in Min uh, Minnesota passed about $70 million to help in disparities off the demographic uh, report, the demographic report that was put in. And they uh, helped with $70 million over the next couple of years. How can, uh, how can we leverage that? Uh, uh, you sitting there with the Minneapolis Urban League president. How can we leverage that? With the Minneapolis, uh, with the Federal Reserve of Minneapolis, to to not let uh, what we got there go away, because you know 70 million, it, it sounds like a lot, but you got to have some leverage. What can the Federal Reserve of Minneapolis help with these uh, communities that got some of these resources to move, to move uh, uh, to make it bigger, and make it bigger, and and knock down some of the disparities? Well, I think we'd be very open to. Understanding, I don't know off the top of my head where that, how the money was allocated. So we'd be very opening, open to working with the nonprofits that maybe are helping manage some of that or decide how it's distributed to look at how can it best be utilized. You know, when I look at it, we have 50 states and every state is doing something different and different communities in those states are all doing different things. For me, we need to look at the whole country and figure out what's working and saying, well, if this is working in New Orleans or this is working in Atlanta, Maybe it can work here. Or if there are pilot programs that are working here that just need to be scaled up. And so what I think our role can be is looking at <clears throat> all of these programs and figuring out where do we get the most bang for our buck? Where can we make the biggest effort? Like one example <clears throat> that the Minneapolis Fed has worked on for a long time is early childhood education. All right, so our bank did a lot of research with other experts around the country that said a dollar spent in early childhood education gives some of the best return to taxpayers compared to other investments. So that's an example where we can do the math, do the analysis, and show local leaders this is a good place to put your resources where you're going to have the best benefit for the community. I, I, would, I would add, uh, uh, Neil, maybe you're being a little modest, but this institute itself, Al, 
is a significant benefit and leverage for the equity work in Minnesota. By elevating the issue of inclusion and opportunity to the level that the Federal Reserve Bank is, we are saying uh, as a policy perspective, not just from monetary policy, but fiscal policy and public policy, that this is a key and important issue. It is worthy of the resources of the federal government, particularly of the Federal Reserve System. That's an argument we didn't have last year when we were over at the legislature, and it's a platform that not only will the research provide for us to be able to move forward, but even now to be able to say in the public policy sector, this is a major statement about the significance and importance of this issue. Uh, my name is Dominic Washington. I'm with the Bush Foundation. That's the Archibald Bush Foundation based in St. Paul. Um, and uh, my question for you is, well, first, I just want to say that this is a really um, exciting uh, development and uh, really thrilled with the leadership that the Federal Reserve Bank here in Minneapolis is taking on this issue. Um, the end result of this work, obviously, is knowledge uh, and, and knowledge that can help uh, our community sort of challenge, uh, recognize, or really come to terms with maybe some misperceptions that we have about what works and what doesn't work. Uh, in the months, years that have led up to this uh, day, announcing this institute, I'm curious about some of the misperceptions that maybe you had uh, going into this work about what um, uh, would be an effective way to address this problem that have been challenged and uh, how that has then shown up in the results. <clears throat> one of the, um, boy, there's a lot in there. Um, one of the surprises for me as I've dug into many of these issues is the need to scale and how hard some solutions are to scale. So I'll give you an example. I visited schools around California when I was running for office and some around Minnesota which are doing remarkable things. I mean, truly remarkable schools, some charter schools, some innovative schools, and even whether charter or not, what I found about these remarkable schools is they're able to take the kids who are most disadvantaged and have excellent results. And so you dig in how they do it. Usually it starts with a brilliant principal who's a visionary leader, who hires great teachers who share that vision, and they create a great culture in that school and they engage the parents, and they have amazing results, proving that every kid can learn. It's not the family, it's not the culture, it's not the community. Every kid can learn. But then, as a policymaker, I sit here and say, now how do I replicate that principle? How do we create a thousand of those principles? And so, and that, I'm, I'm not criticizing those schools, they're brilliant, they're miraculous, but sitting here as a policymaker, now I'm thinking, how do we come up with things that we can scale quickly? Because we can't take another 30 years because there'll be another generation that'll be lost as a result of that. And so I'm not sure if I'm answering your question, but the more I've dug into it, the more I've realized that we need to find solutions, but we need to find solutions that scale quickly because the cost of being incremental are huge. Bill English had a question here. There's a, there's a mic coming to you. Sorry, Forgive me if I don't recall exactly the year. But in, 19, in the 40s, a book was written called The Capitalist Manifesto. I remember reading that and walking away thinking, there's a reasonable solution to ending any kind of wage equality. A few years later, in the 70s, I remember reading an article in Playboy, a real article in Playboy, <laughs> that, that said, 80% of the wealth in this country was owned, exercised, and controlled by 20% of the people. Today, we all know what those demographics say. I guess my question really is, is there really, are you familiar with the book, The Capitalist Manifesto? I've heard of it, but I've never read okay. it. It may be worth researching as part of this institute. Because what the basic proposition was that you make everyone a capitalist. And that says something to me, my mind and in the poverty for a kid, and Stephen, I remember your, your mother's comment. She said it to me all too many times and put some smarts in my head. But I remember as a, as a kid thinking all poverty was urban. 
1975, my company sent me to Appalachia. And I saw white women tremble when you turn on a machine and couldn't read past a sixth grade level. That's when I understood that poverty was at the bottom, bottom of our problems of inequality in this country. And I guess my question is, is there any reasonable way that we cannot have all the focus on the middle class and pay some attention to poverty? Well, I, I think the answer is, I mean, absolutely. It's the core of what we're talking about. And again, I go back in the two examples, in the examples you just gave, and I don't want to say that education solves everything, but man, it solves a lot. You know, if you give young people, regardless of whether they're urban or rural, or white or black, brown, yellow, a good education, it, it's transformative, right? And, and it breaks through so many other problems that we have in society. So I try to focus on root causes and to me, education is a, is a huge part of this. But not everything, but a huge part of it. It's a nascent body of research that uh, argues that um, we don't really have a problem with an unsuccessful system, that the system is doing exactly what it's supposed to do. And what I'm encouraged about with the creation of this institute is really to get to the bottom of this issue, to get to what are, some, what are the structural, what are the fundamental causes. Because if they are, the fact that we have a system that's set up that more and more of the wealth is concentrated, concentrated in fewer and fewer of the people, then we need to address that. We need to name that openly. And I think that the prospect, Bill, of, of what you identified there is that we will find a, a greater and broader coalition of people who are raising this issue. It's not just an issue of color, it's not just an issue of class or geographic location, but it's a structural issue of poverty. And it is a system that is okay, that is accepting of poverty. Uh, <clears throat> yes, uh, I don't think anybody uh, doubts uh, Mr. Uh, Kashkarian's energy or his high intelligence, although Running for governor of California as a Republican indicates that you may need a psychiatrist, but uh, <laughs> uh, I, I need to caution you that I think some of the some of the basic statistics that the Fed uses uh, are defective, and some of the assumptions are clearly ineffective. Uh, most people know that the unemployment rates that the, the federal government puts out once a month by the Bureau of Labor Statistics are understated because they don't make any effort to actually count, to accurately count people who have given up looking for work. And although everybody many people acknowledge that that's the case, uh, the BLS has made no effort to increase their sample size or do anything else to get an accurate number. But that unemployment rate moves markets and if it affects Fed policy, then uh, your compass is way out of kilter. And I have no idea whether increasing the sample size from 50,000 to 100,000 would do it or something, but if you continue to use a defective compass, you're going to be sailing around in the circle. The second thing, a high level of multiple postgraduate degrees has made you very successful, but I caution you that American business will not pay for a college degree for a job that doesn't require it. And right now, although the press and you and everybody else says that in the, all the jobs of the future will require, require postgraduate education, the reality is that only 34% of the jobs in the country right now will require it. And so again, if you, if you think that, or anybody else who's making policy thinks that just getting people to have a bachelor's degree will me mean that they can earn $60,000 a year. You're absolutely wrong. But I'll, I'll leave you with one, ch one challenge, question, whatever. We all know that whatever the rate is for unemployment, it's very high in North Minneapolis and the inner cities of Minneapolis and St. Paul compared to the suburbs. At the same time, Amazon Corporation has opened up a new distribution warehouse in Shakopee, Minnesota, which is 24 miles from here. Uh, they've hired a 1,500 people and they've been trying for a year and a month to hire another 1,000. They've held hundreds of job fairs, although until last month, none of them were held in Minneapolis. But 
I have talked to the city managers in Shakopee and Chaska. I've talked to the Minneapolis City Council. I've talked to the two CEOs that run the commuter bus systems in the southwestern suburbs where Shakopee is. And the, and the question is, isn't there some way uh, to supplement the single Metro Transit bus route that runs once a day and takes two and a half hours to get from where I'm sitting to the front door of Amazon? Uh, Amazon runs three shifts 24 hours a day. They're paying $7.63 an hour, plus a very, very comprehensive fringe benefit uh, program that starts on day one. So now you've got thousands of people that are either unemployed or un underemployed right here. Uh, they have one bus to ride. It takes five hours both ways, and then they have to work down there. They can't use the bus to get there for second shifts or third shifts. And uh, the people that should be trying to solve this problem greeted all my questions with anger and indifference. Why should we do that? Why should, it's, it's, it's the worker's responsibility to show up at our door. And so, this, is, this so, is crazy, but it's at the so, micro level so that the can Fed can't answer, Let us answer the question. Thank you. Uh, so, Let Neil answer the huh, question, actually. Oh, you'd like to take him. Um, <laughs> first of all, unemployment rate. Uh, we know that the headline, let me, let me just be very clear. We absolutely understand what the headline unemployment rate c captures and what it does not capture. The headline unemployment rate, which is 4.7 right now, percent nationally, does not capture people who've given up looking and left the labor force. That's why we look at many other measures which directly measure how many people want jobs but can't get jobs or would look for jobs if there were jobs available. We look at a whole bunch of different measures to understand what is really happening in the labor market, and we look at wages. Right? If the unemployment rate looks like it's low, but a lot of people have given up and rate, wages aren't rising, that makes us think, hey, it's softer than the, the headline numbers appear. But now we're starting to see wages are starting to creep up nationally, which is a good thing, which gives us more confidence that the labor market is getting tighter. So I got your point, and we understand it crystal clear what the data says, and that's why we look at many different measures. Second, on education, I never said every kid needs a college degree. And I believe that there are a lot of good jobs out there that are unfilled today where somebody could graduate high school or could get a technical certificate. I meet with uh, labor representatives of trades, say we can't hire enough construction workers or we can't hire enough welders or we can't hire enough sheet metal workers. And I say to them, why won't you train them if they don't have the skills? They'll usually say to me, we will train them, but we need people who are prepared to show up every day at eight o'clock and get there five days a week show up ready to learn, ready to work. And so what I'm saying is we need to make sure all of our young people have those basic skills to get those good jobs, whether they're college degree jobs or not. And then third, the issue on Amazon, I mean, I think it's a good thing if more businesses come to the region, it'll make, it should raise wages for everybody by creating more demand for workers. But the local transit issues, I think are very important. Uh, they're very serious. People need to be able to get to work. So I, I'm not pushing back on you at all that that's a very serious issue. But I would say that's an issue best served by the local, uh, the local uh, elected officials. So we've got about three minutes left. And um, we've got almost all of our questions from this side of the room. So you all are cut off. <laughs> Hello. So we've got Hello. time for maybe one or two. I got one questions. over here. Go ahead. Uh, talking about education, again, uh, youth in our Minneapolis city. You talk about the technical support. Will you be partnering with the city of Minneapolis schools? And second, will and can we start the recruitment process for technical support in these schools? Because right now, back when I grew up, we had vocational. And if you weren't the best English or best math, you could go to vocational and you would pick up a technical skill like sewing, bricklaying, drafting, those types of things. Right now, we need to understand that we need to go into the building and recruit those young people with these jobs, not wait for them to come to us and find out what they need and what is important to them. Too many times we're sitting back and we're creating programs and we don't go in and ask them what they would like to become or what they would like to do. And we need to change that narrative where we do more recruiting than asking them to come to us. So I think I mean, the answer is yes, we want to help however we can. And we're very open to partnering with 
local leaders, whether it's local schools, et cetera, if we can be helpful, we want to be helpful. I will say, though, just to, we're focused on the research to arm the practitioners. And we want to look at what's working well here in Minnesota. We want to look at what's working well around the country and learn from all of that and say, here are the best ideas, here are the best programs that are having the most success, and then see what can be applied here and then what can be scaled up nationally. Well, you, get the, you get the final question. Thank you. I'm Michelle Sims, and I'm an organizer with MICA, Metropolitan Interfaith Council on Affordable Housing, and we advocate for housing and other things related to housing. And um, my question to you is, um, recently, uh, the Federal Reserve had a lot of us organizers uh, down for some workshops. And uh, right now we're, uh, I'm dealing with a lot of the trans new transportation issues, uh, modes that are coming into our city, which is like billions of dollars. And so we're busy on the ground with the growth and development and uh, putting our thinking caps uh, on. And one of the th um, things that I got out from uh, the Federal Reserve training, that, that you let us, Federal Reserve let us know about the uh, Community Reinvestment Act in mm -hmm. terms of banks' responsibility to the community that they sit in and that the community uses. And so I thought about it, and I'm starting to put together a team of folks to go and call the question to one of the banks in our community. Uh, because recently, when I was down there, I, I asked to speak to one of the um, managers, assistant managers, and said, do you know that the light rail is coming right next to your parking lot? They didn't. And so my question, as I'm thinking about it more, I'm thinking, um, I'm wondering, okay, now, what should I ask when I go in there? Uh, a lot of the training or workshops was on, this is what other states have done, and this is the background, and you can go here and look. So it's giving us information on um, background information to prepare ourselves. And so I'm asking, is the, res is the Federal Reserve uh, uh, ready to act as a resource to us organizers on the ground? And if we come to say, okay, we need some feedback, what should we be looking for? What should we ask about? What should our ears be perking up if they're saying this and saying that? Are you all able, are you all willing to act as a resource to us organizers as we organize and call the questions to these financial institutes. Absolutely, we have, a, we have a whole community development department and community outreach department, many of my colleagues are here today, whose jobs it is to work with people on the ground to say, to help you, arm you with the information you need so that you can best advocate for your community and take advantage of the opportunities that are out there. And so, yes, and some of my colleagues will come visit with you, and I will too, right after this is over, and connect you with the right people. Thank you. Absolutely.